Hey guys, what's up? Good morning, good day, good evening to all of you here listening. What's up? It's um yeah, it's another lecture presentation. Just a quick um what they call this? Just a quick lecture discussion about the history of phlebotomy. So basically uh, guys, we're going to talk about its history, what were the devices used, and the people behind uh, the his, uh, who contributed to, you know, uh, making phlebotomy as safe and as, um, as safe and as efficient as it is today. Okay, so I hope you are all ready to learn. Let's start. So, what is phlebotomy? So, basically, guys, phlebotomy is the act of removing blood from the circulatory system. And it is through a cut or an incision or puncture. Okay, so this is uh, to obtain one's blood for analysis and diagnosis. Okay, so phlebotomy is also a part of the patient's treatment for certain blood disorders or for screening purposes also. Like, um, for example, we get blood to analyze your complete blood count, your CBC. Uh, basically, uh, phlebotomy is a very important part in a medtech's, uh, medtech's life. Okay, so the practice, the practice of phlebotomy has taken place for over five millennium already. So phlebotomy is from the Greek word phlebos, which means vein, and temnion, temnain, to cut. Okay, so basically guys, the Egyptians are the first to perform bleeding by scarification or scarring. And to prove this, there are actually two passages in the Ebers Papyrus or Ebers Papyrus that have, um, yeah, that have been taken as evidence. Now, moving on, phlebotomy was known as bloodletting, okay? Until now, actually, there are still some laboratories that use uh, the term bloodletting, but... Um, I think it has been standardized that when you say bloodletting, it usually, uh, it usually means, or it usually connotates to, um, blood donation instead of phlebotomy. Okay, but yeah, still the word bloodletting is, um, yeah, is still being used. Okay, and in Greece, a prominent Greek physician known as Galen of Pergamon discovered that arteries as well as veins had blood. So basically, they thought that um, these arteries only contained or were contained with air. Okay, now moving on, we have here, it was commonly believed at that time that blood didn't circulate. Okay, instead, uh, they were stagnant or they did not move at all in uh, our upper and lower extremities. So, uh, what they did for their treatment, okay, they gave patients an emetic or basically this is uh, a medicine or maybe an, uh, other substances which causes uh, the patient to vomit, okay? So, Gallen of Pergamon, again, uh, developed quite a complex system for the quantity of blood which should be removed and from what specific areas of the body, okay? So, they believe that um, when you remove blood from a certain part of your body, you know, uh, there's like a specific quantity for that, you will be cured, okay? Uh, consequently, when you remove blood or drain the blood as close as the deceased area or, you know, where the disease is from, um, this will actually contribute to a successful uh, recuperation uh,
recuperation. Okay, now next, the pilgrims are often credited as bringing phlebotomy to the United States um, in the 18th century. Okay, now, uh, it was common at that time to use lancets that were fired in, well, fired good, no, into veins at multiple um, locations. Okay, so over time, these instruments were developed in an effort to improve the technique as what we use now for our um, skin puncture. Bloodletting was a popular service for almost 100 years, although it went out of fashion as many harmful incidents came to light. Okay, so there were concerns about safety of the patients, like for example, um. What do you call this? The the quality of the blood, or maybe you know there were there were what do you call this? So there were troubles, or there were concerns about the safety of the patients. Like for example, how clean or how sterilized the equipments used are. Maybe there were cross contamination between patient to patient. So yeah, a lot of uh, circumstan uh, circumstances were being considered. Now next. We have here bleeding, okay, appears to be, have been a standard treatment for fever, but not, uh, it was not, what do you call this? It was not apl applicable to typhus and your typhoid fever, okay? So these are considered your putrid fevers, okay? So it was considered of value in treating hypertension or, you know, high blood pressure, we have cases of coma and drowsy headaches. Okay, it was also recommended for inflammation of the lungs according to the amount of pain, the pounding of the pulse, and the difficulty in breathing. So, uh, back uh, to the people contributing or who helped contribute to the history of phlebotomy, we have here George Washington. I think we all know him, Siguro, or familiar. So last December 13, George Washington was taken ill with, uh, you know, cold or mild hoarseness. A total of 2,365 ml of blood was taken over 12 hours. Wow. So we have here James Craig, an Edinburgh trained physician, offered no explanation for the total amount of blood that was taken. So basically, all throughout the procedure, it eventually became viscous, you know, Washington's blood, and flowed slowly. So it reflected dehydration and hypovolemia. So hypovolemia, basically, it is the abnormal decrease in the volume of uh, blood plasma, okay? So this usually occurs whenever the patient is dehydrated or bleeding, which in this case, uh, the two... What do you call this? The two circumstances we have dehydration and bleeding is applicable to George Washington. So that's why he had hypovolemia. So this was him in his last illness. So we have here the black, uh, the one wearing black who is close to George Washington is Craig and Brown. Okay. Now, next, during the Civil War, military doctors, so they were unable to cope up with the, the widespread disease and infection. They eventually bled Union soldiers and civilians alike. So, ear, er, early, early instruments included anything sharp, such as horn stones, kills, uh, quills, thorns, or animal teeth. So basically, they used anything that uh, that were sharp to puncture uh, their patients. So the thumb lancet was introduced in the 15th century. So it was a double-edged instrument, often with ornate handles. So uh, they were basically aesthetic in a way. 
and it was made out of turtle shells. Moving on, we have Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch proved that inflammation resulted from infection and thus was not susceptible to bloodletting. So these two people, scientifically, they offered a legitimate way of thinking about the cause and treatment of the patient's illness. So please remember, Louis Pasteur and we have Robert Koch. So basically, guys, uh, in the next slide, we have here your lancets. Okay, now... Next up, we have here as early as April 2008, okay, um, people back then used leeches <clears throat> primarily to bleed patients as treatment for heart problems. We have arthritis, gout, chronic headaches, and sinusitis, okay, but surprisingly, they were able to uh, what they call this? They were able to use leeches correctly, siguro, because in the next sentence we have here, the, le the leeches are for single use only. Very good. To avoid transmission of, dece uh, of diseases. Okay, now we have here, although bloodletting was eventually seen as harmful, it is still used to treat a few conditions like hem uh, hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis, it is uh, basically it is a hereditary disorder in which okay iron salts are deposited in the tissues, leading to maybe uh, liver damage. We have diabetes mellitus and the bronze discoloration of your skin. Okay. So, it's uh, bloodletting is also used in life-saving procedures like blood transfusion, okay? As what I have said a little while ago, when you say bloodletting, it, uh, now it usually connotates to blood donations or blood transfusions, transfusions okay? So, trained for, uh, professionals in this field are called phlebotomists and, um, yeah, they are... Uh, we are present all okay now today trained professionals in this fail uh, in this field are called your phlebotomists okay now next this is a picture of you know leeches being used in uh, in the clinical field Next up, we have here um, the use of leeches, which was called Hirudo medicinalis, dates back to ancient Egypt and Greece and became popular during the Middle Ages and was considered the main method of medicinal bloodletting or, as what they say, purification. Um, take note that bloodletting was at that time prescribed to treat a variety of conditions, which we mentioned, uh, some of the conditions were mentioned a little while ago, from headaches to fever, uh, fevers. Now, Britain used over 42, wow, 42 million leeches a year. Okay, now that's a lot of leeches. <laughs> in Victorian times for medicinal bloodletting, creating an industry worth, okay, that's a lot, 1 million pound per annum at 19th century. Okay, so it created an industry worth 1 million pound per annum at 19th century prices. Okay, so... However, enthusiasm for this practice died out in the late 1800s when the benefits of bloodletting were increasingly called into question. As what I've said, maybe there were cross-contaminations or there were infections, um, the equipments may not be properly sterilized. A lot of circumstances were taken into consideration. That's why um, bloodletting was eventually... Um, was considered or the enthusiasm for it were not as popular uh, was not as popular as it was before 
Okay, so here's a picture of your army lancets. Diba? It's so big. If I were this person, I think I would pretend to die just to avoid this. Imagine this size. Well, anyway, guys, that's the end of our lecture. Just a short lecture about the history of lobotomy. I hope you learned something new from this discussion. And as always, if you have any questions, please reach me through um, Facebook Messenger. And I'll see you guys uh, in the next video presentation. Take care.